it's my pleasure to introduce Niseto Thibault Vital from uh, University of uh, Oxford. Uh, Niseto is working is a student of uh, Chiara Barletto, also from Oxford, and uh, working together also with Vladko Vedral. So uh, these two, Vedral and Marletto, are working among other things on uh, gravitational and quantum mechanics uh, interface, especially on the gravity uh, and uh, the idea of gravity induced uh, decoherence. But today we will not hear about gravity as Niseto will present us a, uh, his work trying to convince us that fermions uh, are locally realistic so that they accept locally realistic uh, models. Niseto, it's our pleasure and the uh, uh, ground is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and allowing me for uh, explain and present uh, this work that I've been developing. Um, yeah, I, as I said in the abstract, um, more or less uh, what I will be focusing on, it's like uh, I've divided the talk in these different parts. Uh, please, inter um, uh, please interrupt me as much as possible uh, because I've allowed for um, some space to draw uh, notations with the pen and everything. So. If at any point you have any question, any doubt, uh, anything that it's not being clear, let me know. Also, I have not timed the presentation. So if it's getting too heavy or it's not getting that interesting, <laughs> just let me know. And I, pardon, I, just, I was just about to say that uh, usually we are trying to, to uh, do it within an hour because then right. from uh, practical reasons, <laughs> the perception of, uh, of people is just, you mm -hmm. know, getting lower and, and lower. Go ahead, please. Makes sense. Um, so yeah, more or less, I've tried to make some, some arrangements re, uh, regarding that. Um, so yeah, like I know that the title is a bit suggestive, but this is what I'm going to try and convince you. And as I said in the abstract, uh, basically I will do a review in this, in the literature that I used for my work, uh, which is based basically into seminar, like into principal papers, one by uh, Hugh Brassard and Paul Raymond Robichaud, uh, where they define what a local realistic theory is, basically. So I will be using their framework in, in that to conceptualize what, uh, what we've done. Um, and then uh, another paper on, on the scriptures, which is related to this local realistic uh, structure, by um, David Deutsch and Patrick Hayden back in 2000. So I will be trying to connect these two, like to have both uh, a mathematical perspective and a, a physical uh, perspective of, of what I'm trying to do. Um, okay, so this will be the structure of the talk, more or less. Uh, it will be very segmented, but hopefully when we get to point three, uh, at the end of point three, everything will come together. So please, let me know uh, any doubt, uh, any comment, and any question. Okay. okay. Uh, what is uh, like? It's very suggestive to say that fermions or the quantum physics is local, like due to the work of Bell. Uh, a lot of people, uh, when when I give this presentation, they think that I have not thought about Bell and these considerations, um, but. One thing is Bell locality, and the other is the local uh, notions that we have. We, we, we talk at a structural level, not at the level of measurements and uh, local games or local distribution of, of, of hidden variables. Uh, we, we talk at a, structure, uh, at a more structural level. So let me first introduce what uh, uh, an operational theory is. Okay, so not even local and not even realistic. So just an operational theory. Um, an operational theory in this framework by Brazart and, and, and Raymond Robichot, um, it's, it's the following. Can you see my cursor? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically we have a set of states, okay? Um, and we need to understand this set of states as um, they give us the epistemological information of our system. So our system is in a configuration, okay? And uh, we have, um, it ha they have properties that we can observe, 
that can be observed from the outside. So it's the, I call it the epistemological properties of the system are encapsulated by some, some mathematical element that I call rho AB suggestively in, in the quantum mechanics case. I have to say that this framework is general and it's not concrete to quantum mechanics, but since everybody here and we will be doing fermions, and like the first time I see it, it's better to think, uh, think in terms of uh, quantum mechanics. Um, so we have these states and we have uh, more structure in it. So we have a notion of systems and subsystems. So this row AB, uh, to have some projector to understand uh, what, what the information of the joint system AB, uh, like what are the epistemological properties of the system regarding only the subsystem A. So we need this kind of projector to connect these different, uh, these different mathematical objects. And of course, in, in, in the case of quantum mechanics, it's, it's the, the partial trace. Um, and we can consider like row AB as the usual density matrices uh, that we have. Then we have uh, more structure. Uh, we have a set of operations uh, labeled uh, like you are the, your operations. So suggestively, this is the unitaries in, in, in quantum physics. Um, and this basically, uh, uh, U has a semi-group structure and uh, it has a semi-group action on this, on this space. So basically you shuffle around, you act with U to your states and you get another state as, as we know. Um, Okay, so this is an operational uh, theory. Now let me jump to what the real, uh, realistic theory is, or uh, yeah, uh, a realistic, uh, a real model uh, is, or a realist. So a realist uh, assumes that um, you not only have the epistemological properties of the system, rather that there is mathematical uh, structure or some mathematical element that describes the actual real uh, properties of the system, the, the ones that constitute the system in itself. And they do so uh, without taking into consideration what can be, what can be measured of the system of, or, or what cannot be measured of the system. Okay. Um, so similarly here we have our, our systems and our systems and similarly the same set of, uh, uh, of operations that act on on our epistemological states, uh, they act on the real states and, um, and yeah, they, they act uh, with maybe with a different action, but they have to act also in them. Um, and then the claim is that uh, between this real that you can deduce the epistemological properties from the real uh, properties of the system, like the constituting properties of the system give you the epistemological properties of the system. So this is in this picture uh, shown by this, that there is this mapping phi between the, the real states and the epistemological states. So one can understand that this is the shadow of this one. Um, here, uh, I have to make a consideration on, uh, there is a restriction in this mapping. So since we, uh, we need uh, we need it to be exhaustive, this for sure, because we want that any epistemological state has to come from a real state, um, this for sure. But we do not ask to, we, we do not demand it to be an isomorphism. Um, famously, like requiring this to be an, an isomorphism, it's called the Leibniz principle which basically can be summarized in the following sentence, which is um, if two objects have the same epistemological properties, like if all the properties that I can observe from two objects are exactly the same, then they are the same object. So this, in this framework uh, would mean that uh, phi is an isomorphism. Um, in general, I would be dropping this requirement because like it's just, a principle, some people regard it as being very fundamental. I do not do so uh, because 
uh, dropping this principle allows you to incorporate other principles that they find important in physics than this one. But this is a matter of uh, discussion. Uh, pardon, um, just, uh, just a comment, maybe it's a, it's very common in, in quantum foundations to adopt the sort of this Leibniz principle, but mm -hmm. then the same people forget the, the, let's say, electromagnetism classes, where they learn about electromagnetic potential, which is non-physical at all. Or people who has touched gravitation, they know that uh, uh, coordinates are non-physical, for example. So it's, it's, it's not uncommon in physics. It's actually, we are trying to impose it in quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, I was planning to do it maybe later, so that's that's nice that you, you advanced me here. Uh, that, that's very interesting. Um, so yeah, so under this mapping, we want that the action on the real states and the action on the epistemological states, it's faithful to this mapping. So this is the usual requirement that if I act with you to my real state, I get to another point. And if I act with phi, I get to the, I get, I have to get the same as if I acted with phi at the beginning and then acted with you to my epistemological state. Um, so basically, the way I understand it is that this space is a shadow of this space. Okay. Okay. So this is a realist theory. Now let's get to what I mean by local uh, realistic theory. Um, the notion of locality that I adopt is the the principle of locality by Einstein. Um, which it can be broken down in two way in, in two parts, in two distinct parts. So the first one is what I call local action, okay, which is widely assumed in physics. Uh, like there is not much dispute that local action is a principle that has to happen, um, <clears throat> which it's basic. It's very much related to the no signaling principle. In fact, they are uh, pretty much the same. Which basically it states that um, so if I'm considering uh, the uh, yeah the projection on my system A or on my subsystem A of a joint system AB, um, I don't care that a unitary that acts alone in B has been acted or not. So this is commonly thought that uh, the properties of my uh, the epistemological properties of my system here cannot depend on whether if somebody in Andromeda has done something or not, unless uh, unless there is like a mechanism by which that action has translated into an action to my system. But an isolated action in an isolated operation in Andromeda cannot have a, a direct effect on on my, on my system. So this is not very controversial, like quantum physics in general, uh, the usual interpretation of quantum physics um, gives you this. So this is not very like, if uh, when we think that locality is violated in, in the quantum level, we do not think that, that this property is being violated. Okay, um, but then we have separability. And separability basically it says that the constitutive uh, properties of a, of a joint system uh, depend only on the constitutive properties of its subparts. Uh, this is known the separability uh, condition of the of, of locality. This famously, let me try to draw uh, an update. This famously, uh, in the usual view of um, why does annotate not work? Okay. In the usual view of, um, okay. Uh, right, so it. you have problems with annotations? Uh, yes, I don't know why. It's... Oh, no, 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 it's me, it's me. Okay, yeah, great. That, that, mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, so in the usual view of, uh, of quantum physics, what basically happens, uh, let me see, can I change? No. Uh, what basically happens is that, uh, okay, I cannot change slide now. Okay, it's fine. Um, what usually happens, sorry for that. Uh, yes. What usually happens in that picture that we had, right? The usual interpretation of a, of a realist theory in quantum mechanics is that 
the real states are density matrices. So that this space and this space is the same, and that the, the, the mapping that we consider is just a trivial one, uh, where is a one-to-one -one mapping, and we consider our states to exist and our density matrices to exist. Um, and to be the constitutive properties of our system. Uh, this is a usual view on, on something like that. But then the problem that we have there is that uh, if I have a general, let's say that it's entangled because it's easier, an entangled uh, row AB, then I calculate row A, I calculate row B, and it is widely known that uh, with row A and row B alone, you cannot reconstruct row AB. Basically, because you have, you can reconstruct two different uh, allowed uh, density operators on the Jane system, and with the information of row A and row B alone, you cannot know uh, which one of the two was the Jane system in the first place. So separability is not this usual description uh, is not uh, it's not satisfied. Um, there is a, another view uh, which I want to comment in a second, which is the following, um, which is no 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 I will not regard that row A are the constitutive properties of uh, of uh, how it's called of my subsystem A. What I would say is that for my chain system, and these these are the constitutive uh, properties of my chain system. But when I go to my subsystem, the constitutive. Uh, so, sorry, Niseto, uh, sorry. like somehow when you uh, you face uh, your left, then the sound uh, volume drops drastically. Okay, so here it's better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I will try not to. Um, Okay, yeah. So another view is that you have row AB as your, um, let's say, as your real state of uh, of the joint system. But you consider that the real state of the subsystem is also row AB, but you give the information that you're in the subsystem A. Um, that, and, and also and, and the same. Okay. And then, of course, separability, it's perfectly reasonable because of course, you can merge them together because you, you still have all the information here. But what now it's lacking, it's the it's the local action principle, right? Uh, this is the weirdness of, of, the, of quantum mechanics because now if I act with UB here, uh, uh, sorry, with UA here, uh, I will be changing my, my state because in this in general, row AB will change. Uh, and since this is the system, like, sorry, the state for the subsystem B, this uh, should not happen in the, uh, due to local action. Okay. Um, was this more or less clear so far? Anything else? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think so. And uh, yeah, Reiki is also shaking his head uh, in agreement. So, <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, okay, now let, let's see if I can go out this mode. Uh, okay, yes. Right. No. Ah, and you unfortunately need to, you know, destroy those annotations now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I don't know what's happening really. Uh, well, okay, I think yes. the best is to take this uh, eraser and simply erase it. Oh, okay. Of course, yeah. unless you need them during the whole presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, 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 it's fine. Okay. It's fine. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Like, I'm sorry, like, this informatics, I'm not very good. No worries. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, in this paper by Brazart and Raymond Robichot, they present this framework uh, where they defined a local uh, realistic theory as a theory where you have this structure and when this separability condition is satisfied. So where you, uh, where, where, yeah, in your real states, you can define 
uh, projections and, and and you can define your your states in such a way that you can reconstruct uh, a global state, a global real state from its subcomponents. Okay, so the goal for us in in fermionic theory will be like we will have this uh, level because this will be the density uh, matrices in, in the fermionic setting. Uh, we know we will know which uh, which operations are are allowed, which unitaries will be allowed. Um, therefore, our goal will be find uh, somehow uh, these mathematical objects where this condition is satisfied, where we have separability, and where these mappings are faithful and, and everything was done. Okay, so this is the, the, the goal to say that uh, fermions are global real. Okay, so it, it has nothing to do with Bell, it's just a very structural level what, what we want to say. Um, actually, in this paper, um, right, sorry to interrupt you, but it happened again, right? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the sorry, drop I in volume. Uh, I, I don't know what's, what's going on, um, but okay. Uh, now it's better? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think okay. it's like when you're facing right more than left. Uh, you're you're, you're or, right. Or, or I, I don't know. Well, okay, you're my. Are you, I will I try to. I would yes. try to shout a bit more Center and is... to look straight. Okay. Okay, um, it's also fine. <laughs> thank you. So luckily in this paper, um, they they give you uh, a theorem, a very powerful theorem with a constructive proof. So uh, yeah, let's go with this. So what they claim is that if a theory has reversible dynamics and satisfies the no signaling principle, then the theory can be given a local realistic structure. It's a very powerful theorem. Uh, because reversible dynamics, basically what it means is that uh, this set of operations uh, has to form a group structure and you will have group actions uh, at this level, at the level of epistemological states and the level at, of real states as well. Um, and second, uh, the no signaling principle is basically this principle at the operational theory, uh, at the operational level. Uh, so somehow what they say is that if you have this condition satisfied and, uh, and your set of operations is a group, I can come up with a concrete way of constructing these uh, real states with these nice properties. Um, the way they do it, uh, this is a bit mathematical, so uh, like if you're fine with it, that's great. Uh, the way they do it is to say that... Uh, mm -hmm. Can I have some uh, general questions? So yes. this this theorem uh, uh, concerns uh, some theories. So uh, maybe I, I missed it in the beginning, like this this framework in which we are kind of phrasing those things. So are you talking about operational theories, GPTs? Like what is the mathematical? So so the, those uh, this epistemological uh, description of yes. the uh, of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I understand that you just uh, uh, described the like all possible statistics of measurements that can happen to the system. Yes. Is that what? Uh, yes, so is at, it like... at the quantum level and at the philosophical level, this is the way I understand it. But mathematically, basically, what they require is that this uh, is a set uh, where you have this lattice uh, system, uh, where you have this. Uh, how it's called uh, systems and subsystems notion with uh, these projectors um, and that you have uh, a group uh, with a group action on it um, this uh, this is what they call a theory uh, an operational theory basically because you have the the operations that can happen to the theory and you have the mathematical objects that are changed by the theory but there is no notion of measurement in this, what no. you said, right? No, uh, there is not. Aha, uh -huh, okay. There um, is not. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have to say that I'm, uh, yeah, the, in this setting, there is no notion of, me of measurement. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Pardon, in a sense, I think the uh, real state, so the ends, they sort of encode the results of all possible measurements that you can make. Um, I think, 
I, ultimately, they will, they will, but I think that, uh, like, even the epistemological states do, right? Uh, or maybe, yeah, 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 uh, yeah but uh, I think one way of looking at the real states is, uh, because otherwise, how, what would be a real state? Okay. I, I will try to all possible measurements and collect them in one one bunch and say, okay, this is my this is my object. I just a loser remark. Yes, more or less yes, but it's a bit stronger than that. Um, okay. I think. Uh, so the constructive. I think it's this is clear. Can I move on or mm -hmm. yes? Okay, that's good. Um, the way the constructive proof they 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 find to to find these real states with this uh, nice separable structure uh, is uh, to consider them consider them as equivalent classes of the uh, of the set of operations that is happening. So, in quantum mechanics, uh, we will have the set of unitaries. Um, so it will be our our real states are equivalence classes on the set of unitaries that we can act our system on. Uh, the equivalence relation is this, and it's very intuitional. Uh, so, in pardon. So, I was completely off. <laughs> <laughs> I completely missed it. So, it's in a sense complementary. These are not the measurements, but these are the transformations that you can make. Exactly. <laughs> Which basically it's the tran the transformations that you have done to create that state in the system. Okay. Okay. I hope this makes sense. So we consider two unitaries to be equivalent uh, under a particular subsystem A. Um, if basically they are the same unitary, but you have applied a different unitary to the to the complementary of A. So you have applied B, and then you are completely free to do any unitary you want. Uh, uh, sorry, you have applied. Uh, yeah, small v, uh, not, not small. <laughs> you have applied v, um, and now you have all the freedom to do any unitary you want, but not inside your uh, the system or the subsystem that you are regarding. So in, this is the equivalence, uh, it, yeah, this is the equivalence relation between the unitaries that uh, you consider, and then you take these equivalence classes, and it is proven in this paper, that with this mathematical structure, um, well, with these definitions, then uh, if you have the equivalence class regarding A and you have the equivalence class regarding B, then you have the equivalence class regarding AB. So you have this nice mathematical structure and you have uh, separability. Moreover, uh, with this, you can deduce uh, by fixing some things that later I will motivate this physically. This is very the mathematical part. Um, you can recover uh, the, the epistemological states in, in quantum theory. Um, in distinguishable quantum mechanics, um, what I mean by distinguishable quantum mechanics is basically where your systems are uh, in tensor products. So you can think of qubits, qubits, uh, anything like this, but you have the tensor product structure. Um, you can find representatives of these equivalence classes. Uh, but as, as being these uh, evolution matrices. So basically, you need, in order to know what is the real state uh, of a subsystem A, you need to track uh, all the operators uh, in A uh, with, uh, with the evolution that the system has undergone, and then you have a representative of the equivalence class that represents the real state of the system. I hope this makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, may I ask something? So yeah, uh, do they comment on whether like this, uh, on the level of this ontic real states, is this necessary to be a unitary group? Or like, uh, is the, like, I guess they chose it because it was natural, but you also were saying before that it's, uh, First requirement was the is some group which acts on this, right? And yes. Mm -hmm. So in in general, um, uh, for this structure, uh, your set of operations has to be a semi-group. Uh, but but in their constructive proof, in order to be able to define this equivalence relation, 
um, and to make all the math consistent, uh, they have only proven uh, with when you have a group structure, but you can have any group. So mm -hmm. okay. I will comment that some things that uh, I want to work towards in the future is to consider these at the level of classical physics as well. Like in order to understand what distinguishes quantum physics and classical physics at this group level. Uh, but I hope it does make a bit of sense and later I will come. So, uh, can I ask uh, some, some yes. further things? So, uh, okay, I, I believe that under those particular definitions of what it means to be local realistic, this theorem, it, it's the theorem, so holds, yes. right? But what is like I'm gonna I mean maybe you you you're gonna discuss it how how it's related to like more orthodox like no notions of like how it could so it's uh, the, the way I, I, okay even if I believe in this theorem so it's it cannot be then used to even if I have the so-called realistic model for distinguishable quantum mechanics as you said uh, like of distinguishable particles I cannot use it to have sample like I, uh, to to disprove Bell theorem, I cannot, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Like Bell theorem, like the only like Bell theorem, the same way as this is a theorem, it's also a theorem, right? So the only way to disprove <laughs> Bell theorem is to attack the assumptions that Bell is is making uh, or sure, the sure. axioms, right? Um, yeah. So maybe let me rephrase. So what is the um, uh, uh, how this uh, local realistic structure manifests in this more like quantum setting manifests onto constraints on possible measurement outcomes or like does it have any I understand yeah, mm -hmm. uh, connection to something that's you know uh, we are more used to in in terms of measurement outcomes I don't uh, in, in the work I've seen so far I cannot see um, any any like any huge difference, but uh, hopefully, uh, like once I've done like the physics part, this is the very abstract level. When I've done the more physics part, uh, this inspires uh, us to think. But what it has been done so far, it's to really understand uh, information flow as a local process. Like it, I think that with this view, um, I really understand what is going on uh, in a lot of. Uh, 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 quantum physics protocols and how the information is being uh, moved around the subsystems in, in the system and it takes away all this mystic of spookiness and uh, these paradoxes when you think in, in these terms so it, it helps you to to make things concrete um, then I think it has other advantages like in the sense what I was trying to comment uh, before, I think it can provide a framework where you can understand and study classical physics and quantum physics at, uh, at the same level. So I think that is quite uh, uh, important. And also it gives you, it's much more general than quantum physics, right? Like uh, I really believe it's a really good definition of what local realistic theory uh, means because all the steps are, I think, philosophically very well justified. Um, and also it enables you to think about post-quantum theories. Like uh, if your post-quantum theories are also local realistic, then how they will have to look like, right? Um, yeah, this is just a bit of, of a very strong defense of, of this view. I hope you like it. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes, okay. All right, La now let's change completely. <laughs> Uh, from this very abstract setting, uh, and let's focus on on the work that we've developed uh, in, the, in the last months, uh, which is regarding uh, basically fermionic quantum information. Uh, so first, let me give a brief definition of what fermions are. Um, basically, the way I understand fermions is that uh, they are quantum systems, so you have uh, an algebra of operators. In order to generate that algebra, you need several things. First, you need a set of modes. The way the, I understand this, it's uh, lattice sites where you can create your fermions. Uh, some people tend to think as modes uh, 
as being the different momentum values that you can give to your fermion due to the usual expansion. But I, since we are talking about locality, it, it makes more sense for me to think them as uh, positions rather than momentums. So it's at which lattice sites I can create my fermion. Um, so basically, you have creation and annihilation operators, uh, but that they anti commute. Um, so they anti commute with one another. Um, and yeah, and this is the usual definition of, of fermions. And you have a vacuum state where basically you interpret it as there are no fermions there. Um, and the annihilation operators just completely kill the vacuum state. Okay. Uh, there is a usual discussion in uh, fermionic quantum information or in fermionic systems uh, in general, which is uh, how to consider your subsystems. Uh, if either you consider your modes as your elementary subsystems, or if you try to come up with some uh, definition of what is a particle and regarding particles are as the subsystems of, of your system. Here, I, I work with modes basically for, for uh, two main reasons, because um, uh, I come from a bit from the QFT side. So for me, it's much more natural to regard as more fundamental modes than particles, um, <clears throat> because you can explain more, I think. And also, they have a nice product, like uh, distinguishable quantum mechanics. We had the, the tensor product. Uh, and with modes, you can define this product that is anti-symmetric uh, in this simple way. Um, yeah, but the only peculiarity is that it anti-commutes at, at, at the state level. Um, okay, then you, what you do in fermionic quantum information, this, I, I am writing a paper on this uh, the last four years. Hopefully it will be out soon. So, <laughs> Um, you can create your FOC basis. Here I've uh, rearranged it in a particular way because uh, reasons that will follow soon. Um, you have first the even states. So basically here you have zero particles, here you have two particles, one in the first mode, one in the second mode. Here you have two particles as well, two particles, and then you have one, one, and one, and three. So you separate the even states from the odd states. Then fermions have this peculiarity. Fermions are a bit more weird quantum systems. This is how uh, my supervisor Chiara thinks about them. Um, is that you, you need an extra rule, which is the parity super selection rule. Um, basically, it states that superpositions of even and not fermion, uh, uh, even and not number of fermions are forbidden. So basically, the state zero plus one over square root of two it's forbidden, or like any state where you have an even and not number of particles superposed, it's it's forbidden. Uh, the reasons for that um, is that it would violate, like if you had this resource, you could violate the no signal principle. So basically all, all, all the requirements that uh, I talk about derive from the no signaling principle and the and the Einstein of uh, separability. Um, or at least they try to do so. Um, so you have this rule, then you can prove that if you want to preserve this structure, so if you want to preserve that, uh, the, how it's called, that the linear operators that act on, on, this, uh, on these states do not, uh, do not jump into these uh, not allowed states, then all your linear operators uh, have to be either uh, combinations of uh, even products or combinations of odd uh, products of creation and annihilation operators. What I mean that by that very concretely is that uh, this is not an allowed operator because here I have basically two uh, creation or annihilation operators and here I have one. So basically the linear operators that are allowed in my, in my, in my fermionic setting are, are, for example, F1 plus F1 dagger, or F1, F1 dagger plus F1 dagger. Things like this where the parity is the same, but you cannot have F1 plus, yeah, F2, F1. Like you can have this 
<clears throat> I hope this makes sense. Um, if yeah, okay. If you want that, I focus more on this part. Uh, maybe I should. I don't know how I'm doing with time. Um, okay. Right. I mean, uh, you, uh, yes. So it's uh, already been forty-five minutes, but yeah. we started a little bit later, right? And okay, uh, not I'm not doing with that. anything. So okay, uh, yeah. All right. Um, then you can extend this theorem uh, using also the no signaling principle. That is that to preserve the super selection rule uh, uh, structure and the, and the no signaling principle. Um, you need that all unitaries, all states, all projectors, and all observables are even in the sense that they are superpositions of uh, of even contributions. So F1 plus F1 dagger, it's not an allowed unitary. Because um, uh, certainly, so uh, this this theorem uh, like assumes this. Okay, like you use this no signaling principle, but yeah. to have this no signaling principle, you have to have a notion. Of, of those projectors that uh, that would be defining subsystems, right? Yes. So so I guess uh, like you you have to like grab like some choices uh, only some choices choices work, right? So as far as I understand, only like uh, those subsystems would be uh, subsets of fermionic modes that consist of uh, uh, what like probably. Uh, like even number of party, uh, even number of modes, something like that, or like um, partitions of basically maybe partitions what, onto. Yeah, basically what I consider as my subsystems uh, are like if I have n modes, I can take one mode, one mode out, so I can partial trace the contributions from one one mode. Um, and in the paper that hopefully soon I will publish uh, regarding this. Um, uh, Yes, you can define consistently a partial tracing operator, uh, a partial tracing uh, operation, and thinking in the framework of uh, that modes are your elementary subsystems, then you consider the, the no signaling theorem and the no signaling topic. I hope that makes sense. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, um, um, but, but then, okay, that, then I have a question. So. Like if you have a, like imagine you have a just ah so then but then this partial trace would move you, uh, would move you between sectors in principle, uh, in principle, wouldn't it? So in a sense, like so because imagine have, I just have two fermions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like imagine that we have two. Okay, so if I partial trace some uh in some odd operator in the one two scenario. This will give me an odd operator in 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 mode one, um, so it's it's faithful to to parity sectors. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks. Sorry for this confusion. Okay. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Like it's it's different. It's difficult to to explain all of this in uh, like with not everything, but okay. Um, okay. So basically. Uh, what I mean by this is what I will be considering as the how it's called, as the epistemological states uh, of the fermionic theory will be uh, things uh, like usual density matrices. So you will have uh, in the global state uh, of n modes, um, you will need to have some operator uh, that is even. Okay, so that is even in the sense that. Um, yeah, that you will have even contributions at each step of the decomposition of the creation and annihilation uh, operator. I hope that makes a bit of sense what I'm trying to say. Um, and also the set of operations that will be acting on, on uh, that will be my operations uh, on this set of epistemological states uh, will be the set of unitaries that is also even. So you, it's so this is because I want the no signaling principle to be satisfied, and once I have this, the theorem applies directly. So I can find the the nominal, like sorry, the real states of this uh, by via the equivalence classes directly. 
because the theorem applies and everything works nicely and then Fermi is not here. Okay, but I'm sorry that I'm a bit off time, but I will try to explain uh, the, the more physical perspective of this because the, the, the paper that um, I was explaining to you in the beginning was in 2017, but similar work was done by Deutsch and Patrick Hayden uh, in 2000. So the, like long time has elapsed in order to really comprehend this and, uh, and put it in a, in a systematic, uh, systematic way. So they came from more the quantum information uh, setting. So I hope this will make more sense. Um, so basically what they did was to work in the Heisenberg picture because they uh, basically said that observations in quantum mechanics are given by, by this object. And usually the way that we understand this is that we have an initial state, we evolve this initial state with a unitary U, and then we, we, we take the expected value of, of the fixed operator O. So the Schrodinger picture, uh, observables are fixed and the, the, the cat evolves. I don't want to say the word state too much, so I will say the cat evolves. Um, but then you have the Heisenberg picture, which it's used and it's said to be compatible with the Schrodinger picture, where you consider the cat to be fixed, uh, but are the observables the, one, the ones that evolve? In, in this dual way, let's call it. Um, so basically it's the observables of evolution what describes the system um, and what describes all, all the observational properties of the system, okay? Uh, connecting to the, the works of the... So a natural thing to ask is, have, have I, do I need to track all the observables in order to uh, know the how all the observables evolve and the answer is no like you can do a first thing where you can find a basis of the observables so in the fermionic setting uh, every observable can be written uh, can be decomposed as a sum of elementary uh, products in each subsystem so in each uh, mode um, like you will have some superposition. So if you need, then you only need to track, uh, you only need to track these local observables. Does it make sense what I'm trying to say? So yeah. Which observables are local? Local, you mean like the individual nodes then? Yes, okay. yes, local in regards uh, that they are generated only by the creation and annihilation operators of the specific mode, like uh, algebraically local. This is what I, I'm trying to say. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> and, and for, for this, you can further reduce that because uh, since the, this, uh, this set of operators are products and uh, yeah, basically they are products of uh, creation and annihilation operators, um, you see that any product of creation and annihilation operator, if you know how the creation uh, and annihilation operator works, you know how every product evolves, right? Once you know the decomposition, does it make sense? Um, yes, yes, yes. And not only that, you only need the annihilation operator because if you know how the annihilation operator uh, works, you just take the dagger and then you know how the creation operator uh, evolves. So in this sense, you only need to know uh, how the creation or the annihilation operators evolve uh, to know how any observable evolves. Therefore, um, you only need to know how this creation, uh, if they are annihilation, how these annihilation operators uh, evolve in order to know uh, the evolution of, of any system. Well, of the system, okay? Um, these quantities are what Deutsch and Haydn uh, called descriptors, uh, and these are fermionic descriptors. Um, for qubits, that is what they did. Uh, they did the same 
analysis uh, more or less. Um, and for for qubits, you can do exactly the same decomposition, uh, but uh, then when you take uh, when you see what are the generators of the individual qubit algebra, they chose x the, the x and z gate because with x and z you can create uh, the identity x z and y, and with the identity x z and y, you can uh, like you can generate any. Uh, with a linear combination, you can generate any qubit uh, operator. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm going fast. No, it's. Uh, I think it's cool, but I, I didn't get one thing. Uh, okay. So I mean, okay. Um, okay, as you can imagine, I actually come from like there are like very different like approaches to this like you know, locality, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, locality of fermions, yeah. right? So. I, okay, but I'm, I'm trying to adapt your point of view still. So Makes sense. when you were talking about those subsystems, uh, like subsystems in the very first slide, uh, there was this local evolution, uh, like kind of uh, like re requirements on, on the local evolution, right? Yeah. Uh, so here maybe you didn't uh, get to this part yet, but uh, like if you have this kind of, uh, if every fermionic mode is for you, like a subsystem or every collection of modes can be subsystem, then you yeah. start to run into troubles regarding like, you know, uh, some, okay, maybe not uh, into troubles in, in, in your formalism, but like, you know, things that are local, unless they are like even uh, unitaries, right? So yeah, they, they, they won't, they, uh, they won't be commuting, right? So, like, no, they, no, no. This is have... the good thing. Like, since they are even, they will commute. Like the, okay, your, so you... the like your observables and your unitaries will commute. Oh, I see. I see. It's mm. like it's the cat that that not commutes, but when you do the cat bra, like the two minus signs cancel each other. I hope this intuition gives a bit. Like, it doesn't make much sense, but I hope it gives a, the intuition of why. That's okay, right. so you uh, okay, so you what you are doing, you are sort of imposing. So your subsystems are individual modes, so to say, yes, uh, fermionic modes, and you say that your let's say local transformations would be even transformation, even fermionic transformations that affect certain disjoint subsets of of modes. That yes, would yes, okay. or even like or, or single ones, but yes, yes, right, right. Uh, okay, thanks. Okay, okay. <laughs> Hope it makes sense. Um, so yeah, for 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 qubits, uh, like Deutsch and Haydn chose this basis basically, but this is the same as like tracking these quantities is equivalent to tracking this quantity, right? Because it's tracking uh, all the all the how it's called. Uh, all the possible, all the possible uh, local operators on on a single qubit, and you can track this quantity, or you can find a different basis for your uh, linear operator uh, set, um, and this is the other natural basis to to find. But if we, if you remember, um, this is exactly, this is exactly what. Uh, the what uh, sorry this is exactly what we had here uh, in 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 the Raymond Robichaud uh, model where this was the representation of the equivalence class so by having found uh, these uh, descriptors uh, uh, pardon I have I have a question to this yes. uh, to this formula if I may Niseto. Yes, so uh, you have a collection here in this qubit example. You have a collection of qubits, mm -hmm. and uh, J is the number of uh, of qubit, right? Is a qubit subspace where your yes. uh, KL projector works. Uh, so then U is a operation on the whole set to understand yes. on the pardon on the whole uh, collection of your qubits. Like it's yes. a big, so to say, big unitary which acts on all. Yeah. And what you do here, you take this exchange operator on the J's qubit and do nothing on, on all the rest. 
and this of course how you can parameterize the big use yeah yeah okay um okay the idea is is the following so uh is by tracking these uh small quantities small in the sense that like you need n uh to track the the whole system um locally one one for each subsystem um but what usually confuses people is that even though I start with the local elements of my algebra in the sense that let, let me make an example. So um, usually let, let's say I have one qubit. Okay, let's do it with qubits. Um, I want to track this evolution, but this does not mean that this will be, let, let's say that this is one. Um, this does not mean that under any general unitary evolution, this will be a recombination of x1 and z1. Like this can be x1, z2, um, and z1, x2, or something like that. Um, it depends whether the unitary is global or, or local. If it's local, of course, it will be a recombination of x1, z1. But, but if it's local in general, uh, if it's global in general, uh, you will have that your, let's say that your, X, your observable x that was previously local in, in your subsystem uh, like it had a local expression in your uh, local algebra, it no longer has because it has mixed uh, during the evolution with the observables of the other system. I hope uh, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, the main point, okay, the main point I wanted uh, to make here is that by knowing this quantity, now we have found the uh, real states of the system in the sense because we have found a uh, representation of the uh, equivalence class uh, on the unitaries that we wanted. Um, okay, now you may be thinking, okay, this is theory, like, but what insight does it really provide to any physical problem? Or like, how do you actually work with these things? So. Uh, if time allows it, I have prepared a simple example, and uh, I have another one if this does not satisfy you. Um, but uh, one of the reasons I thought that fermions were weird in the beginning, and that some people like thought that, think that they are even more non-local than uh, uh, because you have this holonomy when you swap them. Like that, you get this minus one, this minus sign uh, when you swap them. Okay, so what I wanted to analyze was uh, using these uh, descriptors, uh, using these real states. Um, what happens when I perform this swap? So let's say that I prepare my uh, state, uh, my epistemological state, uh, the vacuum plus these two modes being excited uh, in this particular form. Um, and, I, and now I swap them. Once, uh, this is uh, will be noted by the S, uh, the S unitary. Uh, so if you swap them, basically what happens is that the vacuum remains the same, like notice, no, does not notice anything. But uh, here you get a minus, uh, a minus phase because it's just like the two coming here and the one coming there. And since the wedge product anti-commutes, this picks up this minus phase. Okay, I, I wanted to understand how is this phase, uh, like what is the informational, what is the information flow of why does this phase appear? Uh, this is what I wanted to understand. Um, so the first thing you need to see is that you need to create this, this state. Uh, because what I forgot to say is that in the Heisenberg picture, you need to fix uh, your initial state and then your observables follow. And the convention that is usually adopted is that the initial state is the vacuum state uh, and then things happen. Um, but this is just a convention. It, you could work in a different setting. Okay, but adopting this, uh, this convention, um, we need to know by which unitary this state was created. Is the, this is the relevant part of this framework, that the unitary of how do you create your state, it's actually what gives the information of how the system is being created. 
like if you create the same state via different unitary, then the state is exhibiting the same epistemological properties, but it is essentially a different state because it has been constituted differently. I hope this makes a bit of sense philosophically. Um, so the particular choice I, I make of unitary is just that I, uh, my vacuum state, I send it to this state. Uh, and in order to create the unitary, I want that in the basis, uh, the one two state goes to the orthogonal state to this one. Uh, and then the odd states remain the same. This is just practicality. But uh, under this unitary, if I have my uh, descriptors F1 and F2, uh, you can tediously calculate <laughs> that what represents completely your real state uh, is these two pairs. And you can observe already a thing that there is an asymmetry between the two. So th the main confusion in this problem is that this state is regarded as being si a, si a symmetric state, which is completely not. This um, epistemological state has in it uh, an inherent uh, asymmetry uh, because of the like the fact that you have a plus here does not make it symmetric it's just like you inherently have uh, an asymmetry because the one two state is inherently asymmetric between one and so this in, in in this framework is represented in this way so you have an asymmetry between uh between the, the first mode and the second mode um, and then when you perform the swap, basically this goes here and this goes here. That's why it's called the swap. Uh, and basically what has happened is that the relative minus sign has swapped uh, from one place to another. So this is the way I understand that this minus sign uh, occurs at the, at the epistemological level, because you had an asymmetry inherently in your uh, in your in your system when you created your state and by swapping it around basically you have changed the, the relative uh, minus sign and now this is uh, this is uh, made uh, express like i don't know it, it's made patent in the epistemological state um so yeah this is one of the questions i want to solve i i have other circuits to better uh, show my point if you have um, Any questions? This property. So does it like? Uh, will you observe this kind of phenomenon for other, like, uh, ways of preparing the state for other use? Yes. Well? Yes. That, because so it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like you, you will see this phenomenon uh, for sure because what, like, the inside, it's already in the first line, uh, because what you see is that this state. Uh, is uh, it's an asymmetric state. However, you want to uh, like however the u, whichever the u you use to prepare it, you will have an asymmetry there. Uh, and when you swap well, but it, can one then say that this is like an epistemic feature of the state, the sign there, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. The psi, it's the epistemic it feature the, of the state. Okay. The real state. So it, is, so it is will be reflected in any real. Sorry, sorry, I, I couldn't understand. So then it would be uh, reflected in any real uh, like presentation of uh, of the state, right? So is that? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Because since the asymmetry, you already have it at the epistemic level, of course, at the real level, it also has has to be there in order to, to make it arise. Um, OK, uh, I would rather answer questions then uh, move along, uh, but it's just the conclusions. So yeah, we can, I don't know. So basically the three main points that I would be very happy uh, if you remain after this talk uh, are that uh, quantum theory is a local realistic theory in, in the sense that I've described uh, uh, with the uh, Raymond Robichaud and Brassard uh, model. Uh, second, that uh, the fermionic unitaries, states, and observables can only consist of even contributions of the fermionic creation and LH operators uh, in order to preserve the no signaling. Um, 
at a very fundamental level. And third is that with fermionic descriptors, we can explain all phase acquisitions in a local way. In a local way, in this sense that just seeing what the descriptors, how the descriptors meet amongst each other, gives you information of what systems have interacted, what systems have not interacted. Um, yeah, so then the next steps uh, that I want to take my research, uh, uh, I would like to give a full description of QFT in terms of descriptors, uh, particularly explain the AB effect being a completely uh, local phenomenon. Uh, Chiara and Vladka are very interested in that. Uh, we have done the first step doing that in a paper that uh, it's in the archive, so if you want to have a look, uh, if you want to send comments, uh, feel free to do so. Um, second, yeah, I, I, I'm interested in work in finding descriptors for also topological quantum theories. Uh, what I commented before, I, I would like to unify classical and quantum mechanics in a single framework, uh, understanding these pairs of objects and uh, how the group structure in a group how different groups give rise to different uh, theories in the sense that if you have a Lie group, uh, you have a quantum mechanical theory. And if you don't have, you have a finite, I don't know, I have to study with uh, group theory, but if you have like a finite group with such and such properties, then you have a classical theory. Um, and finally, yeah, what I commented is to look for possible post-quantum theories that are uh, local realistic. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions. I think that I wanted to draw a couple of examples more, um, but uh, it has been <laughs> an hour already, so like I don't want to. I wanted to ask, um, what do you mean by topological quantum theories? Okay. Uh, what uh, I, I basically what I'm referring is is to anions, um, to anionic models, and and to see how the how it's called, yeah, to see how the operator algebra there can be broken down in subsystems and, and find the descriptors regarding that those subsystems. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I have a question. Are you familiar with uh, uh, gelfand nymark segal construction? Uh, no. No, okay. And I will, uh, if I may, I will send you maybe a couple of, um, of things. Um, yes. It is possible, uh, it is possible via this gelfand nymark segal construction, uh, it is possible to view states exactly like uh, you were saying, so sort of an equivalence classes of, uh, maybe not equivalence classes, but it, it is possible to construct states, including <laughs> quantum uh, density matrices uh, from a uh, group theory. Okay. Your group theory, which you interpret uh, as a group of uh, allowed transformations, just like you had from the start. Mm -hmm. And then there is a very powerful uh, mathematical construction, which is called this gelfand uh, nymark segal construction, mm -hmm. which allows you to... Um, uh, construct states. Actually, okay. not only states, but it allows you to construct also a group representation. It's a uh, one of the fundamental tools in uh, in uh, group theory. But in quantum information, we also use it without actually uh, uh, appreciating it when we talk about uh, purification, when we have a density matrix, and then. We, we go to a higher dimensional space and purify density matrix. Then in fact, we are using, and this is an echo of, uh, of uh, GNS construction. So it might be perhaps of some interest for you since you rely here on, uh, on group theory and understood mm -hmm. as a uh, uh, allowable transformations on your, uh, on your system. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. what, what, I can, what I can do, for example, you give me a group, which you call a group of your transformation, and I construct two states. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very interested uh, with it. Uh, so, yeah, yeah like, if, if, if you have some references, I'm... Oh, sure, sure, sure. Sure, you, you might find it interesting. Yeah, that's great. 
Okay, any more questions? We had quite a lot of uh, discussion on the way. Uh, anyone else? It does not seem to be the case. So let us thank uh, Nisetu for, uh, uh, for a very nice uh, talk, inspiring, giving some uh, uh, inspiration to think deeper. Thank you very much. Now we understand what you mean uh, that fermions are local realistic. It's not bad. <laughs> very good. I feel Thank safer you. now. I feel safe. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. And uh, well, Same. thanks again. And bye bye.